Father, we want to thank you for the gift of your word and thank you for the series of diving in into your word and finding the cross and finding the name of Jesus across the pages of the Bible. We ask that you will bless us and that you will speak to us in a very specific way today. That we will hear from you, that we will really respond and worship to your holy name. We will glorify you. You will reveal yourself to us in a powerful way and we will take something back with us this revelation with us, that it will transform our lives, it will transform our relationship with you. Guide us, we pray, with the help of your Holy Spirit, without whom we will have no light. Pour out your anointing oil upon us and may this word find good soil for fruit to bear. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. Numbers, uh, many of you came back saying, most boring book, terrible book. I don't want to read it at all. It's just numbers after numbers and maybe that's why it's called Numbers. To me, it's not the most boring book, it's the saddest book in the Bible. Because if you read through the story, you will realize that 75% of the book should not have happened. 75% of the book is God having to deal with Israel's mess-ups. It's not the most boring book, maybe it is, but it's one of the saddest books. Because most of it shouldn't even have taken place. But it did take place. And because it did take place, the Holy Spirit found it absolutely essential to put it for us to read. Which means we can't skip over it just because we want to. We've got to read through the entire book. And believe me when I tell you, it will change your life. Okay, so I want to go back to John 3.16 now, and I want to ask you the meaning of one word in all the words that were said. Okay? I want to ask you the meaning of the word that Karen said. So. For God, so. Love the world. What do you think that so means? Now, God loves us absolutely, abundantly, indescribably, but that is not what the so means here. It is not that for God so much loved us that he gave his son. The actual meaning of the word so there is in this way, or in this manner, or like this, God loved the world. Of course, God loves us so much, but that's not what John 3.16 is about, in case you thought it was. It says, for God thus loved the world, or this man loved the world. And so the question is, if it is in this way, what is John, the gospel writer, really talking about? Because if it is in this way, there must be an explanation to what this way is, correct? And that's where the problem comes in, that we can quote John 3.16, but we can't quote John 3.17, or John 3.15, or John 3.14. Can any of you all do that? No? Uh, I'm going to read John 3.14 and 15, okay? Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up, that everyone who believes may have eternal life in him. In this way, God so loved the world that he gave his Son. Does that make more sense now? Is that in that way that Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness and made a way out for the Israelites, God loved the world so much that he had to lift his only Son up on the cross and make a way for us. Okay. Jesus himself is saying that the Old Testament is pointing to him. Jesus said, you search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. And remember when he said these words, there was no New Testament. And he was clearly talking about the Old Testament, and he's saying that the Old Testament points to him. And that's what we're trying to do here, right? To search the scriptures and realize that every page has Jesus on it. And what we're doing is trying to understand how it's all about Jesus. What we are doing these five weeks is to specifically look for the cross. And that's what we're looking for. And so back to the book of Numbers, context time, the people of Israel have sinned again. First of all, it was their sin that caused them to wander in the wilderness. And now they're grumbling because they have to wander in the wilderness. And so that is leading to more sin, which is leading to more judgment. And so it's this horrible cycle of sin going all over again. And so God sends poisonous snakes among them. That's what we read, right? Okay, so the actual word isn't poisonous snakes. It's, it's fiery snakes, fiery snakes, F-I-E-R-Y, fiery snakes. Like the sting was like fire, and it caused you to burn. Mostly means poison only, I guess, because that's what causes you to burn. But I want you to know that the word is fiery rather than poisonous, okay? Snakes are definitely a form of judgment, and so the people are dying from it. Do the people deserve it? Yes. Do we deserve it? Yes. Okay, so you know why I keep saying this, that they deserved it and we do too. Because I think it is very 
easy for us to forget what we have been forgiven of, to look at the offense that's been caused to us by somebody else and forget that we've been forgiven of so much worse. And when that, and I think there are times when we just fail to extend that forgiveness because we think we are old and forget that God has forgiven a lot more in our lives. And then Moses prays and God says, take a brass serpent, some of our translations say bronze serpent, and hang it on a pole. Okay, the actual word isn't brass, it isn't bronze. Any guesses on what it is? It's fiery. The word is fiery. Take a fiery snake and hang it on a pole. The punishment was fiery serpents. The solution is a fiery serpent. It's brass because it can absorb the fire. Or it's bronze because bronze also absorbs fire. So some translations say brass, some will say bronze, but it's that metal that can absorb fire, that is purified through fire. And that's what Jesus did for us. He became the judgment, the fiery snake. He became sin for us. He became sin and he became the very thing that destroys us. So fire is a form of judgment, fire is of hell. That's what Jesus had to endure. Jesus absorbed that fire like the brass does. And he took it upon himself and he hung on that pole. Okay. Whenever you see the word pole, I don't want you to think of one long flagpole. I want you to think of a cross. This will be important when you read the Bible from now on. And you may not realize it this week. You may realize it next week. They have similar meanings, but just imagine a cross every time you read the word pole. But this brass snake or bronze snake is a picture of Jesus. Jesus said so himself. Just as Moses lifted it up, the Son of Man shall be lifted up. And Jesus takes the form of a snake. Because when we think of snake, generally what we tend to think of is the Garden of Eden and all evil, right? And here Jesus had to become that. All the evil of the world was put on him. That's why it's a picture of a snake there. He became sin for us, absorbing the punishment. So that what? So that we could look and be healed. And that's what the Israelites did. That's what they were commanded to do. If they were bitten by a snake, they came under judgment, which they all did. They just had to look at the brass snake and they would be healed. No fancy medicine. No fancy sacrifice, expensive sacrifice. Nothing they had to do except look. Because they didn't have to pay the price anymore. The price was taken care of. All the judgment on God himself. The only thing people had to do was look in faith and believe. I'll tell you why I'm adding faith. Because it is easy to lie on the ground and say, bitten by a snake and say, how can me looking at a fake snake heal me? And it is easy to doubt in that moment. But they had to look in faith. Isaiah 45 verse 22. Look to me and be saved, all you ends of the earth. For I am God and there is no other. And we might be willing to do a hundred things to earn our salvation, but God commands us to only trust in him. Everybody here knows Charles Spurgeon, the famous preacher. Yes. Did you know he gave his life to Jesus after hearing this message on Isaiah 45 verse 22 and learning that it was about Moses and the serpent? Moses and the serpent. The book of Isaiah and the book of Numbers brought Charles Spurgeon to faith. And he was so impressed by the picture of the gospel in this book, in the book of Numbers, that if you ever look at the logo of his publication, Charles Spurgeon's, it's, it's, it's a picture of Moses holding up the brass serpent. Many people are confused about how the cross takes away our sin and how the technicalities of the cross actually works. And yes, the answer is substitutionary atonement. The answer is that Jesus becomes the substitute for us and that Jesus takes our place on the cross instead of us. And we can get into all kinds of doctrine about cross, Christology, and study of how, where, when, and what spiritual forces were active then. But you've got to understand that the people of Israel had no doctrine about this brass snake. No explanation. They just had to believe. How could looking at a fake snake heal them from a bite from a real snake? That was the question that they had to face. And why was there no other way? Why couldn't they do something to heal themselves? It didn't make any sense to them. But the only way they could be healed was faith. To believe that God has said it, and so if I do it, I will be healed. If I just believe, I will be healed. If I believe in the cross, I will be saved. And the faith is to believe that God has made a way, and that way was for the Israelites just looking, whether it made sense or not. Which means I don't need to understand the entire doctrine of every single verse in the Bible 
before I believe. I didn't understand the cross and substitutionary atonement till years after I came to faith. And that's the story of many of y'all. Many of y'all came to faith in a way where y'all just realized God loves me. And he's doing something in my life. And I don't know what that is. But I'm going to just take a step in faith. And you took a step in faith and eventually you realized the cross paid for it all. Right? Correct me if I'm wrong. But that's most of our stories. We don't need to have all the answers to have faith right now. We don't need all the doctrines to have faith right now. Yes, it is true that we are called to search the scriptures and study and know what God has said. But we take it one step at a time. We believe that God is up to something. We diligently search the scriptures, but even more so, we are called to have faith. Because it is easy to search the scriptures even without faith. And then we just get into our heart. Right? And so we believe in what God has said. Look to the cross. Be healed. Through it all, through it all, my eyes will be on you. I hope the picture of the brass serpent is clear about how that is Jesus. Because I want to move to another instance in Numbers where the cross is seen. <clears throat> There's a guy in the book of Numbers named Balaam. And another guy named Balak. Okay? Uh, what is the context is Israel is getting stronger and stronger and stronger. And they're on the verge of conquering nations and entering the promised land. So there's this nation called Moab that starts getting extremely scared. And so the king, Balak, goes to this pagan prophet named Balaam, who actually, maybe we shouldn't use the word prophet. What we would, uh, in today's yeah, in today's world, it would be the equivalent of someone you would hire to put a black magic curse on someone. That's, that's Balaam. And so Balak has gone to Balaam and said, bro, I'll give you as much money as you want. You curse these people in Israel. All right? And what happens is Balaam, he, go, he, he tells Balak, listen, I would love to. I want the money. You know, man, I'm all for it. But uh, I can't do stuff. I can't say stuff if God stops me from saying it. And somehow this black magic professional has an idea of God's power. And he says, if Yahweh says no, I can't do it. And the Balak says, OK, take money, take money, take money. He's like, fine, I'll just go. And he goes to the top of the mountain. And he overlooks the camp of Israel. He's standing there looking at the camp, and Balaam tries cursing them. And out come blessings. And he says, you will grow as a people, you will be fruitful, <laughs> and this and that. And he's taking the money. Right? This, guy is, this guy is being paid to do the opposite of his job. Right? Fully lied on his resume. And he's there just blessing, blessing, blessing this camp of Israel. Balak is pissed, says, I'll pay you more. Come to this other place, let's curse them. So Balaam goes again on the top, looks at the camp blesses them. And so this keeps happening and he keeps blessing them. That's the context. Right? He's only able to bless them when he's been hired to curse them. So imagine this. He's at the top and he's looking down on the Israelite camp. Okay? What that chapter, that very boring chapter that you all read, gives us a layout of how the tribes are placed. Okay? First of all, the tribes are placed around the camp. Is that clear? Which means God is always at the center. Jesus is always at the center of our lives. It's God at the center of our communities even. This is God at the center of the nation. And it's people around. That's number one. There were four camps. One camp north, south, east, and west. And each camp was a group of three tribes. So three into four, we get 12. Notice this though. The tribe, the camp here was called the camp of Judah. It was the east. Okay? You cannot enter. This is the entrance. You cannot enter the tabernacle unless you go through the tribe of Judah. Who came from the tribe of Judah? Jesus. Jesus. You cannot enter the presence of God without going through Jesus. The word Judah also means praise. And so we enter his courts with thanksgiving and praise. Okay. Anyway, tabernacle in the center, north, south, east, west. Uh, let's start with the left, the south side. Why south? Can anyone guess? <laughs> south is the camp of Reuben, which contains the tribes of Reuben, Simeon, and Gad. Okay. Bethany, since you are there, Numbers 2 verse 16. Okay, can you tell me the total number of people in that camp? 151,450. I'm going to take uh, 10,000 people, one line to represent 10,000 people. So I'm going to draw 15 lines, okay? Is that okay? 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. Okay, next up we have, let's go west, camp of Ephraim. Numbers 2, verse 24. Roshan, can you tell me? Tribes of Ephraim, Manasseh, and Benjamin. What's the total number? 108, 100. 108, 100. So 10,000 people in one line means 10 lines. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Next, let's go north. Camp of Dan. Numbers 2, verse 31. Priya? Number 2, verse 31. Consists of the tribes of Dan, Asher, and Naphtali. How many total? 
157,600. So that's how many lines? 15. 15. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. <laughs> East, camp of Judah. Ramola, verse 9, please. Tribe of Judah, Issachar, and Zebulun, 186,418 lines. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18. You see it now? Yeah. You see it in the most boring chapter in Numbers. How did you find this? <laughs> I've been taught this. That's why I didn't. Do, I didn't find out myself. In case that's what you were wondering. And so I want you to imagine this. Balaam is at the top, looking down on the camp. What do you think he's seeing? Here is what Balaam says from where he's standing and from where he sees this. Numbers 24, verse 17. I see him, but not now. I behold him, but not near. A star will come out of Jacob. A scepter will rise out of Israel. Who's he talking about? Jesus. A thousand years before Jesus is born. A thousand years before Jesus is born, Balaam sees this and says, I see him coming. And this is Balaam, not an Israelite, a pagan black magic sorcerer. Which verse was that? Numbers 24, verse 17. Because God is saying, that's the plan. You don't mess with my plan, Balaam. I want you to see the plan. I will bless my people through the cross. Now I want you to realize what is happening down here. The people are sinning. The people are sinning, they are grumbling, they are whining, they are complaining. By the next chapter, they also fall into idolatry, adultery, uh, sexual orgies, and even human sacrifices soon enough. And while their hearts are blatantly insulting God, trying to spit on his face, God is watching, not allowing the enemies to curse them not allowing others to harm them, but even causing their enemies to bless them because of the cross. While you may be grumbling, while you may be complaining, gossiping, lying, not forgiving someone, cheating, being ungrateful, you may be hurting others and making it about yourself, you may be indulging in something that you shouldn't be indulging in, you may be doubting God, and God is doing 10,000 things in your life and pouring out 10,000 blessings upon you. And you may be aware of three of them. But your enemies, your real enemies, not the people who've hurt you, not the human beings who you think deserve to be punished, not the brother or sister that has offended you, not the person who has humiliated you, but your real enemy the devil and his followers are looking at the camp, are looking at where we are right now and can only see the cross. And they can try to put a curse, but God won't let that happen. And under the cross, as long as we are under the cross, we are untouchable. And they cannot curse us. And even if they try, God will take it and change it into a blessing whether we see it or not. These guys they couldn't see it. They were whining still. But whether we see it or not, God will take that curse and change it to a blessing. Even what the enemy means for evil, he turns it for good. So we look to the cross like Israel was called to look at the brass serpent. And our sickness and our sin is taken away and we don't have to suffer judgment. The enemy looks to the cross and just can't find a way to curse us. And we get to enjoy his presence. Because he has tabernacled among us. That's what John's Gospel says. The word became flesh and tabernacled among us. And it is because he did this and he rose, because he lives, we can face today we can face tomorrow.
and we can keep going on. And so let's pray. Father, we thank you for the book of Numbers and we thank you for that through it all, the cross is visible on every page. Help us see it. Help us see you. Lead us to you, Holy Spirit. Lead us to Jesus. And just as the Israelites had to look to the brass serpent to be healed, may our eyes and our gaze be fixed towards you, Jesus, on the cross, that we will be healed and our sin will be taken away. And help us remember that as the enemy tries to curse us, you will not let that happen as long as we stay under the shadow of the cross. Your plans are to prosper. Your plan plans are to bless. Your plans are to take what the enemy means for evil and turn it for our good and for your glory. Your plan has been the cross and you have taken every judgment away. and You've rescued us. Help us see that every time we read the word. Help us see that every time we pray and help us see that every time we breathe. You can have it all, Lord, all that we are because of what you've done. Because you have given your all to us. May we live in this confidence that our God is mighty and has chosen to bless his people. That our Father is King of the universe and he will not let evil fall on his children. May we believe that. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey there, thank you so much for watching this video and we hope you were blessed by it. It would mean so much to us if you liked this video and subscribed to our channel and also shared this link with your friends. God bless you.